Okay, it is 5 p.m. So let's get started. Welcome everybody and thanks for joining in today. Uh, my name is uh, Jakob Heiden. I'm an application engineer at IOSV in Switzerland and I am joined today by Vasily Savitsky from the Fraunhofer UK Center for Applied Photonics. Hello Vasily. Hello Jakob. Thank you for inviting me to, to give this talk. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, Vasily will talk today about standoff hyperspectral imaging with a turnkey mid-IR QCL dual comp spectrometer for trace explosive detection. Uh, before that, I would want to give a brief introduction to quantum cascade laser dual comp uh, spectroscopy and selected applications of this technology. And after Vasily's talk, you will have the opportunity to uh, raise questions that we will answer. Please also raise questions already during our talks. Uh, you can use the Q&A function of uh, Zoom. There should be a button on the bottom of your screen. Please use that, the Q&A button, to raise questions. So what is a uh, dual quantum cascade laser frequency comb spectroscopy? Um, well, at the heart of the technique, are uh, quantum cascade laser frequency cones. Those are semiconductor laser sources that emit in the mid-infrared spectral regime. And rather than emitting a single wavelength, they emit over a broad spectral range at very well-defined uh, frequencies. The spectrum of such a uh, frequency cone is shown, is shown here. We have very well-defined lines and in dual cone spectroscopy, we use two such uh, lasers and we overlap them on a beam splitter and send them through a sample and detect it on a single point detector. What happens if you overlap these laser fields is that they will interfere. So each line of one laser, the red in this case, would interfere with a neighboring line of the second laser. And since they are at a different frequency, it means that this, this interference will be a beating, a sinusoidal beating at a different frequency between these two lines. Now, since we choose the uh, spacing between adjacent cone lines to be different for the two uh, frequency cones, it means that the difference frequency between neighboring cone lines will be different for each, for each of these teeth you see it becomes bigger as you turn to the right. And that means that we can distinguish them in the radio frequency, on the radio frequency spectrum on the detector. So in, in effect, what that means is we can detect the infrared spectrum by recording this radio frequency spectrum on the single point detec detector without needing any kind of dispersive element, interferometer uh, whatsoever, and no moving parts. So what that means is, this has of course implications to, the, to what you can do with that, and first, this is uh, this becomes very fast, right? So you can record a full spectrum in as little as four microseconds, and you can, since you do the entire spectrum in one shot, you don't you can apply this to uh, to experiments that are non-repeatable. Also, since the lasers emit directly in the middle IR, you have a lot of optical power available, so you can penetrate optically thick samples such as water, for example. And finally, you also have a very high spectral resolution. Some numbers, you typically have about 50 to 100 milliwatts of optical power available for your experiment. Um, the spectral coverage of a single laser module that you can exchange is uh, 60 wave numbers. This goes up to 100 wave numbers currently for some laser modules. And you can choose, you can have laser modules centered anywhere between uh, approximately 2,200 and 900 inverse centimeters. The spectral resolution of each individual cone line is about three times, 10, three times 10 to the minus four inverse centimeters. And the spacing between lines is 0 0.3 wave numbers. The time resolution I mentioned is four microseconds. And in this short time, time scale, you can achieve a noise floor in your absorption measurement of about 0.01 OD or 0.01 absorption units. And if you integrate for a longer time, you can reach uh, uh, on the, on the, uh, noise floors on the order of 10 to the minus five uh, absorption units. 
Here you see a picture of the iris advanced spectrometer, but there's also another version of this spectrometer that is the iris core coupled with an iris detect. So here on the right, you see the iris core. This is really just the receiving bay for those laser modules. So this way you can you have the maximum flexibility to integrate this in any kind of setups that you might have in your laboratory. It's about 30, 30 by 45 centimeters and 30 kilograms in weight. And if you combine this with, with what we call the iris detect, as is as was done by uh, Vasily Smitsky, for example, then what you get is uh, a fully functional infrared spectrometer. Because you not only get two detectors, but you also get all the digitization, the signal processing that you need to actually convert your detector signals into mid-infrared spectra. The iris of one and the iris core have been applied to a wide range of applications. Uh, one, for example, is protein dynamics. So people have studied the folding and unfolding of proteins in different chemical environments, as well as uh, biocatalysis. Combustion diagnostics is another popular field, in particular if you want to do shock tube experiments that are very challenging because you need a very high temporal resolution but can only repeat your experiments maybe once or twice a day even. A very nice match with uh, our spectrometer this is also a stop flow technique. We've also done spectroelectrochemistry, photochemistry and photocatalysis, heterogeneous catalysis and many many more. We have coupled the spectrometer with all kinds of accessories from transmission cells, uh, ATR, um, drift cells, multipass cells, optical fibers, you name it. I picked now two, two examples that I want to briefly highlight. The first is a study of non-repetitive non uh, protein catalyzed reactions. So in this case, the group of Karsten Kötting was interested in the hydrolysis of uh, guanosine triphosphate, GTP, by GTPases, so by an enzyme. And the trick they played to initiate their reaction at a very well-defined uh, moment in time, which you need to then resolve this uh, with a high, high, high temporal resolution, is they caged their uh, substrate, the GTP, chemically, and it, that we could be released via a high energy um, laser pulse via photolysis. And so this is obviously, since you break this bond, this is a non-cyclic experiment, it happens only one, so steps can fully transfer infrared spectroscopy is not really applicable here because you would have to repeat this tens of thousands of times maybe, or at least thousands of times. So you would rather turn to rapid scan uh, FTIR in this case. Here your, your uh, time resolution is typically limited to 10 milliseconds. And if you go to these short time scales, you will oftentimes be limited by a very poor signal to noise ratio. So in the paper in analytical chemistry, the group of Carsten Kötting showed really nicely that the uh, iris of one can step in here very, very effectively. So this is a kind of spectrum that they got in one shot. Uh, the color encodes in this case the short absorption which is on the milli absorption unit range here, so 10 to the minus three. And you see the spectrum being resolved on a 10 to the minus two milliseconds, 10 microseconds scale uh, over the full range of 60 wave numbers. If you're interested in this kind of applications, I really want to encourage you to uh, visit our website and rewatch the webinar that was given by Carsten Kretten on the topic and browse, of course, all through all the other applications that we have there. The second field of application that I want to talk about briefly are our high resolution measurements. If you talk about high resolution infrared measurements, you typically talk about gas phase spectroscopy because then you have very narrow absorption lines. And typically these absorption lines are much narrower than the spacing of 0.3 wave numbers uh, of our cone lines by which you sample your spectrum. So you can easily end up in a situation where you would miss an, an absorption line completely and be blind there essentially. So what we have to do to use this high spectral resolution of the comb line over the entire range is we have to sweep the center wavelengths of each of these lines across the gap between two lines. And this is what we did together in this case with the uh, group 
of Lucas Emmenegger and Michele Cianella that was published in Optics Express last year. And in this case, you can see a spectrum of methane at the, at the reduced pressure of 105 millibar to have uh, lower, to have narrower sorry, absorption lines. And what you have to see is you get the entire uh, get a spectrum with a, res with a resolution of 10 to the minus 3 inverse centimeters over the full span of 68 numbers. And you get that in as little as 120 milliseconds. Actually, excuse me, actually you can even reduce this time to below 10 milliseconds. If you do this 120 millisecond measurement, what uh, the group of, uh, here achieved is a noise floor that you see here in the residuals of a void fit to this absorption line on the order of three times 10 to the minus three absorption units. And of course, this again decreases with increasing integration time. There is also a webinar on this tab topic. So please also have a look at that, as well as another, uh, another webinar that was uh, with uh, Professor Muriel Lepere, where we actually showed that we can do even better than the 10 to the minus three inverse centimeter resolution. With that, I already come to the end of my introduction. And um, before uh, handing over to Vasili, I want to brief again, I encourage you to raise questions in the Q&A as with the Q&A uh, function of Zoom. And briefly introduce Vasili. Uh, so Vasili is currently affiliated with the Fraunhofer Center for Applied Photonics in Glasgow in the UK where he works on novel laser sources and on optical sensing. He received his uh, PhD in 2005 from the Institute of Physics in Minsk in Belarus, where he worked on nonlinear optics of quantum dots in glasses. He then stayed for two more years in Minsk in, at the International Laser Center, where he also worked on passive mode locking and thermal effects in lasers. He then moved on to Glasgow, to the Institute of Photonics uh, in, at the University of Strathclyde, where he worked on diamond photonics. So with that, Vasily, I'm looking forward to your talk. Please uh, share your screen and take over. Thank you, Jakob. Just a moment. Yeah, I hope you you can see my uh, screen at the moment. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, my name is uh, Vasily Savitsky. Uh, thank you, Jakob, for giving me an opportunity to make a presentation during this webinar. I'm with the Fraunhofer Center for Applied Photonics uh, in Glasgow, and hence the tartan behind my behind my back. So uh, today I'll uh, speak about. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about motivation behind uh, this research uh, spectroscopy of uh, uh, spectroscopy of explosive materials at standoff. Then I'll present you uh, experimental setup and describe the methodology behind these measurements. Then proceed to experimental results in static regime and in scanning regime and finish with some summary and conclusions. Uh, unfortunately, in recent recent tragic events in cities across Europe and in many other uh, locations across the globe, when individuals are able to move uh, freely across a city, like in the case of Manchester attack or in Brussels, or drive a car like in uh, terror attack in Glasgow airport, with explosive materials either in a backup or in a vehicle, uh, so these events demonstrate that uh, there is a urgent need for uh, improved explosion, explosive detection and identification uh, system across a range of use cases. Uh, at the moment, there are two well-developed and routinely used techniques for identification of explosive materials in the field. These are uh, Raman and Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, or FTIR. The examples of commercial uh, 
devices are, for example, Thermo Scientific Search Defender or Hazmat ID by Smith Detection. Uh, FTR spectrometer requires a sample to be put inside it for analysis and the range of Raman spectrometer available commercial is very limited. So uh, there is a clear demand for highly sensitive spectrometers capable of fast identification of harmful materials at standoff. At the research level, two technologies based on optical methods are pursued at the moment. These are uh, UV Raman standoff detection, which requires high energy UV lasers, which poses some eye safety issues. And the second technique is infrared backscattering spectroscopy or IBIS with QCLs with fast wavelength tunability using mechanical wavelength sweep. Uh, in addition to some issues associated obviously with mechanical nature of wavelength scanning element, such system often use quite expensive mid-infrared or fine infrared focal plane array detector. So there is still a demand for more research to be done in the area of standoff high sensitive spectroscopy of harmful materials. Uh, so this is the reason why we believe that a marriage of uh, this new fast dual comb spectroscopy technique developed and commercially available from Irish sweep uh, with a scanning system developed in Fraunhofer UK for fine infrared lasers is a natural choice for such standoff spectrometers. The flexibility of Irish sweep system for integration with a scanner gave us a possibility to develop this lab-based uh, dual comb scanning spectro spectrometer. So now I'll briefly describe the main components of the system. Uh, first, uh, as Jakob mentioned, uh, the so-called iris core component or laser sources. Uh, in our uh, measurements, we used two exchangeable modules uh, with a frequency comb centered at 1240 and 1300 inverse centimeters. Uh, the first one uh, had output power of 60 uh, milliwatts and the second one 20 milliwatts. Unfortunately, uh, due to non-optimized optics uh, used in our scanner, this power dropped to about 15 milliwatts and 6 milliwatts correspondingly on the target. Uh, the beam size was between 0.6 and 1 centimeter at the distance of 3, three meters. Iris Detect, another component of the system, uh, is a, we used MCT detectors uh, with a bandwidth of about uh, one gigahertz. Next component is scanning system. It is consisted of projection calva pair for scanning in X and Y direction and collection optics comprising a telescope and a set of uh, lenses uh, to focus backscattered light into a signal detector. Uh, two compensation Galvo mirrors were used for image stabilization on detector in X and Y direction. So this scanner uh, was designed for uh, operating at distances longer than three meters and at three meters at head instantaneous field of view of about 20 by 20 centimeters. Uh, now I'll describe uh, the samples we used for experiments. These were explosive standards supplied in ampules uh, with the volume of one milliliter and ampules contained 0.1% uh, of RDX or PETN solutions. Uh, to prepare samples with various surface concentrations, we used uh, different volumes of solutions according to this equation and deposit this on various substrates like zinc selenide, sanded aluminium and black plastic. After evaporation of the solvent, uh, we got the samples with a surface concentration of between 31 and 2 micrograms per square centimeter. Uh, 
the measurements were carried out in two modes. Uh, first one is reflection absorption mode. This is when the laser beam can pass through a sample and uh, then diffusively reflected from the sanded aluminum plate, which is positioned behind the sample as shown on this picture. After absorption by the target, this reflected light is then collected and detected by the spectrometer. Uh, in the backscattered mode, well, this is when a substrate, in our case, uh, black plastic, uh, does not reflect much of laser radiation and the signal on detector uh, will be determined by laser emission reflected by the target itself, in our case, PTN. Uh, rather large uh, slide. So the principle of measurement in scanning mode and data analysis uh, is shown on this slide. So after initial, the so-called background acquisition, where when we measured the background or reference spectrum of just sanded aluminum plate, sample measurement starts. So after scanner moves laser beam to a certain position, sample acquisition of this certain point starts. Each acquisition took about two milliseconds. So we have two millisecond measurement time per point in space. Since as Jakob mentioned, uh, each spectrum takes four microseconds to be acquired. During this two millisecond uh, measurement time, we could acquire about 500 spectra from each point. After that, we did averaging, calculation of standard deviation and spectral smoothing accounting for standard deviation. Spectral smoothing allows us to reduce the speckle of a system and all these procedures uh, were carried out using IRSWIP software. Then, and uh, this was already done by Fraunhofer, we carried out spectral processing, uh, subtraction of baseline uh, using the so-called asymmetric least square smoothing algorithm and calculation of so-called Pearson correlation coefficient i.e. the statistical correlation between measured dual comp spectra and uh, those of the same sample measured with standard FTR spectrometer, in our case, Agilent 630. Then the process is repeated again until all the points are scanned. After that, we plot the so-called heat map, visualizing uh, the values of Pearson correlation coefficient using traffic light system. Uh, in static mode, no scanning is done, hence the name. The beam is positioned uh, on the sample and eight millisecond acquisition is taken with 30 acquisitions in total. The data analysis algorithm is the same in static regime. So uh, next slides are the results of measurements in the static mode. First, it is all uh, RDX on zinc selenide substrate in reflection absorption mode uh, at the distance of uh, three meters. Samples with various surface concentrations between 31 and two micrograms per square centimeter were measured. Here's a red line, uh, this is the results of Tolcom spectroscopy measurements. And these measurements were compared with those spectra measured by a standard FTR spectrometer, black lines here. The corresponding correlation coefficient between these two, two spectra are shown and they change uh, from 96% to 86% as the concentration goes down. This shows a good agreement between the two types of measurements, TCS and FTR. Uh, despite lower uh, signal to noise ratio for smallest surface concentration, which is two micrograms per square centimeter, which we measured, we obtained relatively high R number, 0.86, uh, 
which indicates that in principle uh, the actual detection limit uh, in a static mode might be even lower than, than that. In the same uh, static mode, we carried out the measurements of PTN on zinc selenide substrate and on sanded aluminium with surface concentrations of 3 and 7 micrograms per square centimeter. Again, good correlation between 91 and 94 percent between dual comb spectra and FTR reference are clearly visible. Another example in static mode is the measurements of PETN with surface concentration of 5 micrograms per square centimeter deposited on black uh, plastic. Uh, this time the measurements are done in backscattered mode. As you can see, uh, with no sample, so red dots here, uh, black plastic plates, uh, plate has very little reflection, about 1%. With the PTN deposited on the surface, the majority of signal comes from the sample, i.e. PTN. So this is a blue line here, with 4 to 6 percent uh, reflectivity coefficient. This reflectivity spectrum, blue line here, uh, was compared with the one available in literature. Uh, this is of PTN, reflect, re reflected from black. Uh, aluminium, black dots here. After baseline correction and subtraction, we compared these two spectra and found good correlation between them, DCS and FTR measurements of about 90%. Finally, uh, some examples of measurements in scanning mode. First, RDX on zinc selenide with a surface concentration of 31 micrograms per square centimeters. The scan is done in uh, 2.7 seconds. On the left, you see some examples of absorption spectra measured using dual comp technique without baseline correction. So what is shown here, the spectra are presented uh, before laser beam hit the sample. Uh, time stamps about uh, 0 0.02 to 0 0.04. So these lines here. At the position of the beam on the sample, so time stamp stamps of about 1.11 and 1.12, red and blue lines here. And at the position of the beam, again away from the sample, towards the end of the scan, timestamp about 2.64 seconds. This uh, thin purple line here. After plotting the R number as a function of corresponding space coordinate, we have this uh, heat map where R number corresponds corresponding to position of the very high number corresponds to position of a sample in the target area, which is a good outcome. Uh, at the same time, we see some so-called uh, false positives in this uh, heat map, and these are high R values at space coordinates where no RDX uh, sample was deposited. Uh, these points correspond to this spectra. As you can see, these are basically uh, straight lines, but for some reasons, after our automatic baseline correction algorithm, we calculated rather high R numbers. And this means that obviously we must use uh, uh, develop more robust method uh, for baseline correction in the future. And there are lots of publications on this topic and we'll just pick up the best technique uh, during the next stage of development. And the next slide uh, shows the result of scanning of more substances deposited on various surfaces. RDX on aluminium, PTN on aluminium and zinc selenide and PTN on black plastic. Uh, these are substances with a surface concentration between 3 
and eight micrograms per square centimeters. Uh, this slide demonstrates quite good capabilities of our developed spectrometer for detection of harmful materials with low concentration on various surfaces, considering this is just the first feasibility studies. Uh, I should mention that there are some false negatives in case of PATN deposited on black plastic. Uh, this means that probably this surface concentration, about 5 micrograms per square centimeter, is close to the detection limit of a system in a kind of, I would say, in given incarnation. Uh, to conclude, uh, we demonstrate the first proof of concept standoff scanning doll comp spectrometer for traces of explosive detection and identification at 3 meter distance. It has estimation, estimated detection limits of about 2 to 8 micrograms per square centimeter and at the moment is capable of scanning uh, the 18 by 18 centimeter area in about two and a half seconds. Uh, more technical specifications for this lab-based system are summarized here. So it's capable of operation in two modes, scanning or stationary, with a field of view of about 20 by 20 centimeters, as I mentioned. Special resolution between 0.6 and 1 centimeters. Uh, scanning speed in principle can be can be reached as two milliseconds per pixel, and it means that the area of 400 pixels can be scanned in one second time. And detection limits are in scanning mode between three and eight micrograms per square centimeter when we have two milliseconds per point acquisition, and might be go down as down as two to three micrograms per square centimeter stationary beam when we have total acquisition time of about 240 milliseconds and decision making is based on automatic identification of dangerous substances in traffic light. And thank you for, for listening. Okay, thanks Vasili, thanks for your talk. Uh, we already have uh, questions. The first probably goes to you. Have you tested your system on non-uniform samples, that is non-flat? So can you comment on the impact of the surface uh, roughness, shape? Uh, well, not yet, uh, but this is, a, is in our plans. Uh, uh, yeah, at the moment we, we just did the measurements only on smooth surfaces like uh, Aluminium, sanded aluminium, although it was quite quite rough, I would say, and zinc selenite and uh, black plastic. So, yeah, rough surfaces are in our plants. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question I would say is an evergreen. So, what defines the bandwidth of your scanning range? Can you extend the the range uh, well above sixty two hundred wave numbers? Maybe also at the cost of reduced resolution. So uh, first, it's not a, it's not a scanning range. It's really a, it's basically a one shot everything. Uh, the second point, uh, there was a there was a webinar with uh, Ashley Face. He's the uh, can be seen as one of uh, he's definitely one the expert on on uh, on quantum cascade lasers. He commented that uh, with future developments, those combs might be as broad as about two hundred wave numbers. In the future, we will, we will see. Of course, this is something we are eagerly waiting for and also we work on. Um, the other thing that I want to mention here is two things. Of course, you can extend it by exchanging your, your, your model, modules and repeat your experiment. That's what you can do already now. In the future, we will also want to investigate possibilities to uh, combine, so basically to par parallelize, right? Have multiple lasers uh, going to be going on at your go, going through your experiment at the same time and and in this manner then then extending the range um, there is another question by Amikan. is there a, a recording of this webinar available there will be yes uh, it's going to be available through our homepage and our youtube channel okay okay there is another uh, Question here. Uh, it is um, okay. How does your how does your um, 
the dual comb approach that you have shown, how does this compare to to other uh, to the other techniques that you have mentioned in the introduction? To I guess uh, so, Raman, I guess, and, and the ECQCL approach. All right, I can just show you uh, example. Well, uh, in terms of uh, Raman uh, technique, at, I, I suspect the best uh, results are still to come. I understand at the moment uh, sensitivity of this method is uh, relatively low in comparison with IBIS technique, and you need quite uh, powerful pulses in UV spectral range. In terms of IBIS, uh, the most recent results uh, obtained by a uh, US Naval Research Laboratory as follows. They used a QCL source uh, with MEMS leveling scanning technique uh, with a power of 350 millivolts. As a detector, we use MCT focal plane array. And at the distance of one meter, they uh, demonstrated uh, detection limits comparable with ours, so it is five micrograms per square centimeter of PTN and hard Dixon glass. Although the measurement time in this case of the detection area of about five centimeters was significantly longer, at about 25 se seconds, and the authors claimed this is limited by the QCL wavelength tuning speed. So these are the, the best. Uh, uh, results obtained to date with uh, alternative techniques. Um, there is another question that just popped up. Uh, what, which detection limits are required for real-world applications? Uh, well, based on literature data, unfortunately, I'm uh, I'm not experiencing all these uh, numbers myself, but based on literature data, it is assumed that uh, surface concentration of about five micrograms per square centimeter are equivalent to the residues uh, the individual can leave by with a fingerprint on the surface. So uh, really traces of explosive materials on surfaces left by your fingerprint should correspond to this sort of uh, surface concentration. So we are rather close to um, real life situations. So obviously testing on real life objects would be the, the best option to figure out the applicability of this system for field applications. Um, then uh, maybe before following up on that question from, from me actually, uh, so what do you think of the uh, to get there and to have a real world applica applicable uh, uh, an instrument that you can apply to the real world, what do you think are the most the next the steps that are still required and the most challenging ones? Uh, right, I think there are, uh, we, this can be split into three uh, stages. Uh, first, first, it is uh, further development of your uh, sources. As you mentioned, uh, the best option would be to combine several uh, QCLs with wider spectral range on one platform and without compromising the time which requires to acquire one spectrum within the whole spectral range. So the wider range, the more uh, kind of harmful materials we can detect in one go and the more reliable uh, data we can get. So this is in terms of uh, uh, sources. The second one is in terms of the software. As you saw, the data analysis is still lacking some reliability. So we need to improve, as I mentioned already, uh, baseline correction algorithm, improve speeds uh, at which this uh, background uh, spectra are uh, corrected, uh, targeting, for example, real life uh, mapping of the R numbers in the heat maps. And the third one is uh, move towards more field uh, friendly uh, system. Uh, would be absolutely beautiful if we could get rid of uh, water cooling of your system because it, 
water cooling uh, limits applications in many in many use cases. So this is what I would say mo the most challenging uh, things we should do in future. Then uh, before closing, there's a final quick question that I think is easy to answer for you. The plots you show uh, in the in the plots you show comp spectra uh, appear to be more noisy than FTIR. What is the reason for that? Well, uh, don't forget we 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 do the measurements at at standoff at the distance of three meters, and in case of FTR, uh, this is a standard commercially available uh, spectrometer. Uh, we've polished uh, this optical design and detection system. Although uh, even with FTR, we it took about I think ten seconds to acquire one spectrum due to high number of averages uh, taken. In our case, we uh, aimed for as quick as possible scanning of the area. That's why we limited ourselves only to two millisecond acquisition per point, and hence we have quite noisy spectra at the, at the cost of, so uh, we have faster scanning at the cost of a bit higher noise in comparison with FTR at, and at the same time, we did the measurements at uh, three meter distance. Okay, so there was one more, and so I think also easy for you to answer. How hard was the integration of the dual com source with your scanning optics? Well, uh, the scanner was already uh, designed for mid infrared sources, so to be honest, this was quite straightforward, and uh, it took a, some time to align the system for this specific source, but. In the end, it was uh, quite a pleasant experience, to be honest. So, no, no challenges here. All right, perfect. There are no more questions at this point. So, I would like to uh, close the webinar. Before doing so, thanks again so much, Vasily, for joining us today. Thank and you, everyone else, for joining in. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.